Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, you know, for everybody attending this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Yan Chen from Duke University. Um, um, I'm working with the Professor Zhong Yi Hao from National Tsinghua University to host this, uh, we call the Design Automation Webinar, the drawing, you know, which is by both CETA and ACM CKDA. Um, Zhong Yi, you know, doesn't feel well today. So uh, he kind of asked me to start this um, uh, webinar. So this will uh, be the second event of this uh, drone you know, uh, series. So we will have the fair side chat about the career development for the scholars in the EDA's research. Um, we have a very prestigious you know, speakers today you know, from six different universities across, you know, three continents, uh, including Professor uh, uh, Diana uh, McLaughlin uh, from UT Austin. You know, she recently moved from uh, CMU to uh, UT as serve as department chair of ECE. And then we have a Professor uh, Tim Chen from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, Again, you know, he moved uh, from UCSB, you know, to Hong Kong, I believe in the last two years and uh, served as the Dean of Engineering School and also provides a, 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 a Giannani uh, D. McKinney from EPIFL and he uh, was uh, the formal director of uh, electrical engineering in Institute there. And I also have a Professor A. A. C., uh, uh, Cosman from Boston University, and also Professor Philip uh, uh, Stanley uh, Mabel from University of Cambridge, and uh, J. J. V. You know from uh, Tamu. So they are all very productive and the famous you know, professors in the EDA society. And today um, we invite them to share their opinion and also thought about how to become a successful. Uh, EDA scholars and uh, you know if, if there are any uh, experience they want to share. Um, so um, uh, um, so I want to mention you know an, an additional event which we will organize in the back with that will be the next month, um, also sponsored by the actual ECDA and the ACM CKDA. That's uh, you know that career uh, a early career workshop. Um, that will be uh, July 19th, Sunday, and also you'll include a lot of panels with a de detailed discussion about all the topics of interest to our audience. Uh, I was actually, all the uh, six uh, speakers today, they actually very extensively involved in this, uh, you know, world workshop in the he uh, history, and they were even served as organizers before. Um, so um, the final thing I want to say is we need to, we need everybody you know, to join the community and join the organization so we can uh, promote the EDA research together. And um, another, some other thing I want to mention is today we use you know, the Zoom, uh, webinar function, which means you may not be able to uh, speak, but you can still type your questions you know, through the Q&A function so um, the, the, uh, the panelists or the moderator is able to pick up the questions and answer verbally or type in the Q&A board too. Um, so to the next, I will pass you know, this uh, moderator to uh, JV, so he will uh, help to you know, moderate this, uh, you know, the first side chat. Again, this is not a you know, traditional panel, which means you know, we're not going to concern the topic and you know, or the conversation, you know, between the speakers, rather than, you know, have a free chat about all the questions and of interest to all of us. So, Jelly, so are you able to start now? Yes, I am ready. Okay, that's your show. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending upon which part of the world you are at. Um, so, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy these days. Uh, so start with, uh, maybe we can talk about like uh, how our lives have changed in the last three, four months and uh, how we tend to remain still productive even these, uh, even during these tough times. Uh, so Tim, would you like to go first? Like how would 
how has your role has changed over the last three, four months and how is working from home? Uh, I think you are Good. muted. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, I think from two sides, being an administrator, this has been a lot of headache. Uh, dealing with a large number of students, I think some of my colleagues can, can also share that experience. But on the other hand, as a researcher, I, I think this is probably the most productive time for many of our students and the researcher because uh, a lot of typical disruption and not being able to focus, having fragmented time of your day, all this constraint is gone. So um, really, I think this is a once in lifetime experience that uh, after we become a multitasking uh, professional researcher and educator, I think uh, during this period of time, does allow us to reflect and uh, focus, which I think is a very refreshing. Um, but I, I will stop here. I think everyone has probably similar experience. Well, let me say my take. I share what you say, but the, I see a downside. Uh, the downside is that you need a critical mass of people around you to create some enthusiasm. As some of the work and some of the uh, innovation come because there is a push like this. And today in my work, I'm really, uh, there is probably 25% of my group present and everybody's encouraged to work from home. So technically we do work from home and we do lots of Zooms and we do the communication, but the bandwidth that you have by being in person is actually much higher. So I miss a lot the fact that there is not this interaction. And also that I don't see my colleagues. I don't see what happens laterally to me. That's that I see as a problem because I can manage my group, but if I don't see what happens in other groups, which is hard because I cannot break into somebody else's Zooms or I wouldn't have the opportunity of knowing the times and all this, um, I'm missing something. Diana, would you like? Who oh, next? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think nothing is the same and nothing will ever be the same, unfortunately. Um, um, I share some of the things that have been said. Uh, I mean, we are, I think we are all um, fortunate to be computational researchers. Um, but whoever um, the researchers are that do non-computational research, that's, um, that's hit them pretty hard. Many labs are still closed or have reduced density, um, so you cannot really make progress. Um, now, it's true that we have a, a lot more unsegmented or um, I guess you can say you don't have that much interruptions, but that's not really the case. Um, I mean, there are people who have to juggle not just doing research or school or teaching or taking classes online, but also their families. Everyone was at home until recently, schools are out, but um, it's really, really challenging. And I, you know, I'm fortunate that my children are grown up, but if you have young children, and I'm looking at Aisha, because <laughs> I know she has children who are young, um, this is not have been easy, that has not been easy, um, and it's not gonna be easy. Um, and, um, and I'm saying that even if we're back, it's not gonna be the same. Like um, Nani said, I think the uh, spontaneity of interactions is gonna be different or is gonna be gone fully. Um, so we have to adapt to this new normal after, <clears throat> excuse me, after 9-11, we adapted to going through all these um, insane checkups at boarding up an airplane. I think something will change in everything. It's not just gonna be when you travel, it's, um, when you enter a building, when you have a meeting, or we do not have a conference and you can't have this panel in person. I think it's going to be a long way until we're going to be able to do things um, like we used to. Um, but humans adapt. Uh, we will adapt. But it, there's a lot of challenges. And um, um, like Tim said, um, yeah, having, having uh, thousands of students that you have to make sure that they learn, um, they do research, they also have lives, um, and everything is very challenging, much more challenging for them, especially if they don't have access to the right technology and they still have to make progress in everything. So I'll stop there.
and uh, let Aisha and Philip. Yeah, speak. sure. Uh, so I was going to say, but Diana already beat me to it. I was going to say that whoever is talking about increased productivity in the times of this coronavirus clearly doesn't have a small child. <laughs> so that's um, not the experience that we've had. I mean, I can't really complain because, you know, it's been really uh, fun family time. I have a one year old, uh, but you know, uh, there's no hundred percent of working, a uh, hundred percent being the normal work, you know, when you are a parent. Um, so, and you might hear him in the background if he doesn't fall asleep soon. So, <laughs> so it's been, uh, it's been um, a challenge. It's been interesting to adapt. As I was saying, I can't complain because, you know, we are fine or healthy, thankfully. Uh, one other thing that's, I think, um, important is, yes, we are computational researchers, um, but um, I checked in with my students, uh, like on how they are doing mentally and psychologically from time to time. And one thing was that uh, people had um, had some difficulty focusing, uh, especially towards the beginning of the pandemic exploding, you know, uh, with all the um, anxiety about like what's going to happen with this virus and anxiety about their families and everything. Uh, so now it's like more business as usual, like people are more productive, I think. And then one other thing that's been going on for a month is this um, growth in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and that affected a lot of things in the US as well even though we are mostly staying at home uh, so it changed things uh, and it changed how much uh, hopefully it's going to change things for the better in the long run um, but it's interesting that we are home so much but then there's so many things going on and affecting um, us so it's been a, a unique time Philip, how are things in uh... Cambridge. Yeah, the, the UK is a, a very interesting place. Um, it's been an interesting um, first few years for me being here with also with uh, what's going on in the world now. Um, I wanted to, to second a lot of the things which um, Nani, Diana, Tim, and Aisha already said. One of the things which I noticed with my group um, once the epidemic started was, or once the pandemic started, was the challenges of not being within the lab. We're fortunate that we work at the boundary between experimental work and computational work, so we could move a lot of work out of the lab. But having to work from home reduced the access, which a lot of us depended on for infrastructure and a lot of the camaraderie, um, which we had, I think, taken for granted. Um, and I think Nani pointed some of this out already. And one thing which we started, which helped us a little bit was to have a daily brief stand-up discussion. So every day at 10 a.m. UK time, um, all the members of the team, wherever they are, some are in Greece, um, others are here in the UK, others elsewhere, just to have both a technical discussion um, so other people know what you're working on, but also a discussion of, you know, what are you worried about? Um, and that, I think, has, has helped us. Um, I think many people in computing, applied mathematics in general, in the physical sciences, I think it's reasonable to say that many of us are introverts. At least I can say I am an introvert. But it's still challenging not to have um, that interaction with peers um, and to have that ability to pick up new ideas by osmosis almost. And that... Um, is something which I hope we begin to appreciate more in the future. Definitely, I do miss my uh, coffee room conversations with my colleagues. I think that's where some of the nice ideas usually come up. And uh, yeah, so just to lighten up the mood, um, have you taken up any new activities during these lockdown times? So to give you an example, I started cooking daily. I never thought I would do that. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start and, you know, hand over to my, my colleagues. I'm not as fortunate as you. Um, I have dinner duty every other day. So I was having to cook every other day already. Um, my, my wife doesn't let me get off the hook so easily. One thing which um, I have been doing more is um, my wife and I garden, um, not sort of cosmetic gardening, but, you know, we grow our own vegetables and 
um, having to battle with caterpillars and understanding, you know, how to grow broccoli the right way has been a revelation. Um, but that's not a, a, a technical um, sort of uh, idea. What, on the technical side, one um, important thing, which I think um, I have begun to, to grapple with, and I don't want to say I've sort of learned yet, but understanding how to listen better in my um, sort of online conference calls with other people and making, trying to make myself better understood. Um, the need for that has been accentuated by the, the absence of the, the in-person face-to-face discussions. And so I hope, you know, after the pandemic is, is over, it's something which will be a transferable skill, which I and my team could um, apply in other, in other um, contexts. But I think that's, that's it from my side. Awesome. So I can share from two different accents. One is more personal, which is, uh, I think in Hong Kong, uh, we experienced uh, the COVID-19 earlier than most of you. I think we start pretty much late generally. So from early February to pretty much end of April, I got a chance to hike every weekend because you know you go out, you don't want to touch anything. You don't want to interact with people. You want to maintain social distancing. And many people didn't know Hong Kong has probably 80% of the land actually are classified as green area, national park, et cetera. So after being here literally four years, it was the opportunity for me and my wife going out and hiking without talking, which is quite experience. And the second experience is more related to work. Um, we start our new semester supposedly February 1st, but uh, because of COVID-19, which occurred late February, we delayed the start of semester by two weeks. And we have been pushing for mixed mode teaching, blended learning, et cetera, for so many years. But this was the time really mobilized the entire university to do interactive online teaching like Zoom, schedule in the, uh, teaching in the scheduled class time, but everybody goes in. So a lot of training, they have to use the visualizer, use three devices, face, see the PowerPoint, see your face and see the whiteboard. So this comes through a, a mode that we never experienced before. But because of that, three weeks later, we did a survey to the entire university. Surprisingly, students initially is very inactive toward online teaching, but the survey showed the result is better than the typical semester, which is a physical class. So this taught us a lot. It means uh, if you do it right, there are a lot of things should be changed. And what we learned is what we did before was not the most effective way. So that's another piece I think is relatively surprising and very new to me. Nani? Well, my concern is how long uh, is it going to last in the university setting? Uh, we plan to have a regular semester and we hope the situation will be such that we can have it. I think that the experimentation was good. I think as Tim said, we discovered many good things, but if we were to get into a mood uh, like I think in Italy it is that where next semester it's already blown away and people talk about having spring 21 or not, uh, then it's uh, really serious because especially young people in the first two years may not get interested in going to school at all. Uh, again, because of the balancing of the uh, technical and emotional experience of a university. So, um, Yes, so I, I look forward to be back into the classroom again. Uh, use this opportunity to change uh, a few things. Uh, probably encourage more uh, learning beforehand than more discussion in the classroom. Um, also mix more systems, but uh, I do hope that we will have presence. Diana, did you pick up any new uh, activities? Sure. Um, 
I mean, I have a hiking trail right next to my house. So, like Tim, hiking. Um, I mean, we walk our dog every day, which was not happening before. So he's very, very happy. Pets are the happiest, right? So I think they're going to have a hard time adjusting going back. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, there's good things. We spend more time with our family and we pick up things. Um, we, we cook not as well as we'd like, um, but yeah, we cook more in rather than take out. Um, and uh, so I think that's great. Um, like Nani said, I, I'm looking forward to going back. I, ha I wasn't teaching this semester and I'm, uh, being a department chair, I'm told you shouldn't teach because you're not going to have time. But I, at some point, I would like to go back. Um, I don't think I'll be able to go back in the next year because I think these challenges will still be here. So there won't be enough time. But um, yeah, I think there are good things. Um, so. Ajay? So I haven't really had the time had the time to pick up a new hobby or anything, but I've been uh, like building things for my son in the patio so that he can play outdoors, <laughs> like a water table, a play yard, and things like that. Um, because the playgrounds are now open, but it's still, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you want to test out uh, whether we catch coronavirus in the playground. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been a busy time. I mean, in most days, actually, by the time uh, you know, I take a look around. Oh, it's already like four p.m., five p.m. So it's been busy with research. When teaching was on, it was really busy. Um, online teaching is a you know whole different animal, I think, and we had to switch very abruptly. And so research is very active, and then you know family activities actually fill up today pretty quickly. I picked up a new activity that's online shopping. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's not new, but uh, like um, I haven't done this much online shopping. Um, I think all my life combined in the last, you know, three months was more online shopping activity because we didn't want to, you know, go to the stores or anything and they were closed for a while. Uh, so time flew, actually. I don't know how the three months went actually, but I'm um, looking forward to going back to somewhat more normal life. Hopefully if uh, things were better, but that's going to be, uh, not very soon, I think. So it's going to take uh, another year. In fall, some campuses, including ours, will open partially, um, but we still don't know how that's going to look like exactly. So I think uh, mostly it's going to be a combination of some in-person activities and some online activities. <coughs> Flip, I hear you have a question. Yes, um, so I have a question for, for Deanna, uh, Tim, and Nani, and it's for, for a researcher who's in um, a department which has people from the physical sciences as well as people from computer science, electrical engineering, I find it, especially as someone who studied in the U.S. and moved to Europe, that it's challenging to... Um, get across the idea to my colleagues, for example, that ASPLOS is a good venue or that, um, you know, some of the venues which we all know, DAC, ICCAD, are good competitive venues. And anything which is not a journal paper, essentially, if it's science or nature, everyone knows. But if it's not science or nature, then people, you know, question, you know, what you're doing. That is the context. But I think that there has to be a way to uh, to operate in this context successfully. And I don't think it's unique to Europe. So what I'm curious is if you have any advice, ideas, um, perspectives about how to, to function in such a context, whether it's, you know, um, in the US, in Switzerland or in Hong Kong. I mean, the, the way, this is a very common question, but the way uh, you address it, you make a list of all the selective conferences, starting with ASPLOS, continuing with ISCA, Micro, DAC, ICCAD, um, and you show the acceptance ratio and compare that to a journal, a journal would accept more. Um, and also it takes much longer to publish. Um, explain that much of the things that you can publish in these conferences is very relevant. 
So it has to pu be published earlier rather than later. Um, and I think you just have to educate people around you. So um, I've been I've been at three institutions. I mean, at Maryland, I've only been there for less than two years. Uh, but at both uh, CMU and UT, there is enough knowledge within the department. So you have people with degrees in math and physics. You also have people with degrees in computer science, electrical engineering, or computer engineering, or ECE. Um, but there's enough understanding that they know um, what constitutes a good publication record. Um, it may take more effort to educate people at the college level or institution level because, of course, like you say, uh, Philip, um, publications that are not journals or well-known journals may, may seem like, oh, you probably this is just what, a presentation? Usually a presentation is just a presentation, but it's actually 12 pages or 14 pages worth of writing and results and years of work. So, so it takes a lot of educating. And also, once one person goes through, then it's easier for everyone to understand. Um, of course, um, these are large institutions. So I, I, what I'm thinking is perhaps Cambridge is on the smaller side and there's not a lot of um, background to look at, right? So uh, people need to be educated. One, one way to do the, that is when there are periodic reviews and uh, there are external reviewers, for example, letter writers, if they are from um, you know, places where this has been done already, those letter writers could educate those who read the letters. So I think that that's very important to do and it should be done. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't really have this problem, but I, because um, now we're going through the promotion and tenure process, so I have to make sure that the people who go through the process in my department present their case very strongly. They need to make sure that everyone understands that this is not just the presentation, it's actually a very publication, and it's even more prestigious than a journal. Um, so I have to do some educating uh, on, on my own for others uh, in the college and in other departments. Um, I'd like to take a slightly different twist, uh, which is related to the impact uh, of, of our work. And I think that's related to the fact that conferences this year have been going virtual, and probably at best they will go hybrid in 21 and in the future. But uh, in the past, uh, uh, at the conference, people were getting the paper as part of the uh, a download or part of it. And you didn't have to wait for Explore for three or four months to have it published. And then you were reaching directly to some people. And nowadays, if you have a virtual conference, now that there have been a few, people seem less interested to go and browse for Explore or using Google Scholar to go and dig papers into conferences. So we might lose part of the impact related to that. And in my opinion, it would be imperative that when we have something presented at a virtual conference, the material is open access to everybody in the world at the same time. Come on, we're in 2020. We cannot live, and I've been a volunteer for ACM and IEEE for many years, on a model in which we set up conferences where fees are quite high, there's a lot of infrastructure, and infrastructure is slow. This is unacceptable. I think as we look at way, new ways of doing things, we should really look at the thing of immediate open access. So uh, back to the issue, I think for faculty at a uh, growing stage, especially for promotion, uh, Philip, the problem you just described is very common, but has been improving in the past 15 years. For example, today, if you look at computer science department, pretty much conference paper has been dominating versus journal, for example, which is about 15 years of making to reach where they are now. And the mechanism which has been established, for example, senior faculty related to in your field, before promoting any candidate, I think they need to, in the faculty meeting, in the university meeting, to prepare for the list of top conference in the field, or even educating the general uh, evaluators, what the relative importance 
in 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 terms of conferences versus journal and in terms of citation count. For example, if you are in the civil department, which is part of my portfolio, if they have a cita Google citation of 3,000, it's very, very high. And if you are working in machine learning today, if you have the, that number, it is almost look like you're not making any impact. So even citation count itself, for a well-established university for evaluating the productivity, we often say it's just for reference. It's never been used as absolute measure. And likewise, conference versus journal, in most organization, I think, at top university, it should have the knowledge of importance. For example, let me give you an example. In our uh, ECE department, there are so many different subgroups. So each group will have a list of category A conference, category A journal, category B conference, category B journal. You cannot have every conference is a topic, category A for, for sure. And this kind of knowledge information has to be maintained in the department. So every time you hire someone, for example, look at resume for applicants, that will be a reference. And the, you use the same ruler, use the same yardstick to evaluate your own faculty from the publication aspect. And uh, we cannot ignore the fact that, that in academic, no matter how we say about impact, publication, citation count remain to be a very important metrics. However, how to, to evaluate that based on the question Philip you asked, conference or journal, et cetera, et cetera, that domain knowledge with, for specific field, I think all departments need to develop that independent of a candidate, independent of the field. And then the mechanism, I think you should work with your, for example, more senior faculty, advocate this. I see CAD is a top conference and include that in the document for your uh, department's promotion committee. And then those preparation has to be well prepared. That's I think is good for the long-term health of organizational development. Otherwise we'll get into the argument that if someone needs, we so often that if someone wants to promote a person, they can decorate the person, whatever they want to decorate. But if they don't want to promote a person, they start using this kind of a, uh, nonsense argument or oh, conference is not as important as journal, which in my opinion, uh, reflect the health of organization and the top university like Cambridge, I think should, should be very well uh, prepared for that. I don't, so my point is you probably don't need to worry too much, even though there are some selective faculty member or particularly senior ones still quoting that, oh, journal is the only forum, but I believe once come to the real evaluation assessment, uh, most of the university is pretty savvy in terms of uh, knows what's going on in our field. That, that's my, my point. And the last point is, if there are new case coming up, usually every case discussion in the department and in the college is a new educational process. And I have seen in the past 20 years how step-by-step step um, the discussion evolved. For example, you are in UK, you know the research assessment exercise, RAE, in Hong Kong too, which is not known in the US. But you know, 10 years ago, in the last assessment, all the publications submitted by faculty for assessment are journal paper. Today, in computer science department, 80% of papers submitted are conference paper. But if you ask when they first submitted, you ask a faculty in mechanical engineering, they would say, why they only submit conference paper? And I said, oh, you asked the wrong question <laughs> because you're not in their field. You don't know what's going on. So, so I, I think that's my answer to the, the general question you asked. Thank you all very much. And it also helps that our panel is very diverse. Particularly, we have a department chair, we have a dean, and we have successful people who have run large scale institutes. So we get a different set of views. So along the same lines, I think there is a question from the audience. Uh, so the question is, what could be the impact on academia job market, whether short term or long term uh, because of COVID-19 and especially given the visa restrictions of certain countries? So um, 
I, I, I'd like to comment on that, okay. if that's okay. Sure, totally fine. I mean, it's, it's open. Yeah, sure. yeah I, I've done several faculty searches um, and um, um, in computer engineering broadly. And uh, this is something that is yet to be seen, essentially, the impact on job market. As of now, what we are doing is to um, try to plan as much as possible as if it's going to happen like business as usual. It's not going to be business as usual. I think, it, like, at this point, that's obvious. Um, but there are going to be some faculty searches, uh, so it's not going to be completely zero. Uh, but it's probably going to be much fewer positions in the market um, than usual. Um, but it's going to come back. Uh, so this happened, and the coronavirus didn't happen before, but this happened before. Like I was actually on the job market in 2008 and nine, <laughs> So I know <laughs> we've, seen, um, we've seen this before. Uh, this is going to be probably a little bit more severe even. Um, because the economical impact could be more longer term. Um, but a lot of schools um, are trying to see beyond uh, the you know, year or two that's ahead of us. So people will be hiring, people will be uh, opening new positions. Um, there are uh, you know, money allocated for that. Now, regarding visa issues, um, that's again in the short term, we expect to see some uh, impact of that. As of now, like you can't get a work visa in the U.S. until the end of the year. Uh, you can't come into the country um, uh, if unless you have a green card. Um, student visas should be okay, but then the embassies are not working. <laughs> so, so clearly, there's going to be some impact for uh, for this from the students coming to campus side, but also from the faculty search um, angle. Uh, again, I think if anybody is going into the job market soon, I would strongly suggest to try to see a year or two ahead um, and, you know, positioning yourself accordingly because things will come back to normal-ish, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever the new normal is. Um, but we will see some impact in the year, next year or two. Well, to be quite frank, without getting into politics, what will happen in 21 and beyond will depend more on the election than on COVID. Um, that's, uh, I think that in the news of today or was yesterday, maybe in the US, that there would be no green card issued or no H1 visa for the next six months. It's really a disastrous move for the United States tech market. That's, a, that's an abominable decision. Um, outside the US, like in Switzerland, for that, is still more or less business as usual. I'm in a state university, it's a federal university. We have our budget, we are actually hiring along the cycles of the hiring. So we are not seeing anything related to COVID that will change. And also Switzerland typically is uh, fairly stable that if things uh, get better or worse with a 20 years horizon, so <laughs> people still get hired or are going to be hired. Uh, probably the, um, the thinking is in which direction you want to go. And some areas like computer science are still extremely promising as hires because of the need to educate. Really still masses, companies, uh, corporations uh, uh, to use uh, CS uh, uh, tools at all levels. Uh, in other domains, and we, for example, we talk about EDA, it's more critical, there are not that many EDA companies, and uh, um, sometimes it's hard to get the message of what a thesis in EA is about. Uh, so that will affect, in my opinion, also the type of profile of hires in the years to come. That's not only related to EDA, but related to the entire silicon business, uh, from semicon to fabrication to circuits and to EDA. I don't know, Tim, you're probably in the best place, you know, where things are going to happen. <laughs> so that's... Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, we continue to hire. All my seven departments are hiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, many of our colleagues comment that under the very unfortunate situation, which create a special advantage for some university, which are not hit by the budget. 
being a public university and the government has been fully supportive for the growth, particularly there is a drive to change the economy more from the service economy to knowledge economy in this area. Hiring more STEM related professors uh, definitely is a continuing effort. So from that aspect, um, I don't see in this region, there will be any slowdown. And the, maybe there even acceleration of hiring talents due to the circumstances. And I want to extend the comments about uh, uh, the visa as well as the graduate student aspects. I think what happened recently um, generated a lot of panic in, for, in, among Asian students, particularly going to US. They are not going to get a visa and the school is about to start. So several universities, including ours, we extend our graduate student application, particularly only to PhD students for those who change their mind and they, or they've been forced to change their mind initially going to US to study, we open our extension uh, uh, deadline for PhD application. And just we, after we opened that, we got hundreds of applicants. And many of them got top university offer from Stanford, from UT Austin, from you name it, all the top university. Is their choice? to apply to HKUST, probably not their first choice when, because they plan to go to US. But now they all apply to us and we even offer them special scholarship. So I just want to mention this is not just for faculty position, for any talent level. When there is a crisis in one place, it's opportunity in other places. And this shift around all the time Six months ago, we saw we were in crisis, but now we see a window of opportunity. And this can change two, three months from now. So the advice to everyone who are looking for a job is be open-minded. I think in our area, there is a global competition for talents. If one area don't have the position, other area will have a lot of position waiting for you. So it, you have to be open-minded. Otherwise, if you just stick what you want, in terms of certain constraints, the area, the region, etc., then the choice will be very limited due to COVID-19. But if you are open, then the tremendous opportunity in front of us. That's my opinion and my observation too. Yeah, I mean, um, like Tim said, um, one someone's loss is other other person's gain. Um, I mean, that's absolutely um, the case in this case. Um, so the problem with uh, the international visa restrictions um, is that U.S. institutions rely 90% um, for their graduate research on international students, and those students cannot enter the country. So embassies are closed. Um, there's additional constraints on um, all kinds of, you know, pick your, take your pick. The, there are... I mean, if you slice and dice, at, at this point, we cannot really continue research as usual. And in, in fact, um, among my admits for this year, um, the only student who's going to come for sure is one who is already in U.S. Um, one is going to go to Switzerland, to ETH. Um, others, I'm sure, will stay, um, you know, maybe in Hong Kong or maybe in China or wherever they are. So I think it's... Um, we used to get a lot of great students from Greece when Greece was in trouble. Uh, then, then Turkey, when Turkey had some issues. Uh, uh, so, you know, um, that's, that's right. I mean, these, the, the clock turns and then um, you get to, to another situation in the future. In terms of uh, the academic job market, most U.S. institutions have continued um, hiring for, if they had started hiring this year, but um, many have stopped um, and many rescinded offers. There's a lot of uh, postdocs out there um, looking for uh, an opportunity and, and we have a list uh, waiting because we couldn't proceed further. Usually we can borrow uh, from future slots, but this year we couldn't. Um, and that's, that's unfortunate. So I think for some time there is a backlog 
Um, so we will be able to hire from that pool whenever we're open. But they might decide to go to Hong Kong or Switzerland, who knows, uh, because there are clearly positions there. In terms of financial um, impact of COVID, of course, it, it affects everyone in U.S. Um, it, to some extent, it might be worse for private institutions because, for example, you've heard about Johns Hopkins. Um, they actually were very open in, I mean, they have a medical school and they couldn't do any elective surgeries. So that created a huge hole in their budget. Uh, state public institutions are not immune either. So um, the state funding coming for uh, coming to UT actually comes from oil industry. And we all know what happened with oil price recently. So, um, so there, these things are so much intertwined that, and you know, US is a, is a huge economy. And when I say economy, I'm also including education because it is part of the economy. So I think we're gonna see impact um, for many, many years to come. Um, there will be, there is some buffer in the system in the sense that we, there are still, we're still gonna be higher. Whoever is still out there hanging for that hope that uh, academic jobs will open. Some will decide to go to research labs. Some will decide to go to other countries. Um, but at some point, because we're not getting uh, grad students now, we're going to see that bubble uh, push through at some point in the pipeline. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be, and all the decisions related to visas are, uh, I'm not going to say, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call them unfortunate and poorly thought out. Um, but it's much more than that. It affects everyone. Um, and it affects high tech industry, it affects education, um, it, it affects everyone um, in this space. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I hear you have some questions. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so actually, it's uh, along the lines of one of the attendees' questions. Uh, so a lot of the, um, I mean, there's an explosion in machine learning and AI um, and data science, maybe broadly. Uh, so how do you see EDA uh, growing with this growth? Um, there's also already a number of research topics. If you look at any tab conference or journal using machine learning to solve EDA problems um, and the like, or hardware for uh, machine learning. Uh, bunch of different topics. Uh, so where do you see um, the most interesting intersections or uh, is it going to be mostly machine learning type research in the future? Uh, do you see this as a hype? So what are your thoughts? So maybe I can start. Let me, let me share with you a, sto a story. Um, I was with UC Santa Barbara when I was a chair. Uh, Part of our job is recruiting new faculty members. And uh, in my department, one of the most distinguished and the senior faculty member, Herb Cromer, he happened to be a Nobel Prize winner. So every time if we want to hire someone without his approval, it's very difficult to get through the case. So as a chair, faculty want to put, present a case in a hot topic and uh, <clears throat> It's one a very good candidate, but there are so many of them in that hot topic. So he has experience. I, I personally present to him, ask his opinion. He told me that Tim, I'm old enough to see the top uptime and downtime for every field in the department. And uh, he said, don't chase faculty because of their topic. You hire people because they are good because you hire someone for 30 years in their career in the department minimally, and once their field become cold, will they be able to continue to contribute to the department is your hiring criteria. And you tell me this person, because he's good or because his topic is good for the department for this moment of history. And I use that example to also share with all of the researchers that um, hot topic will get cold. And there's so many people working on that. In academic, the criteria for success is being the best. You can be the best in a niche area. But if you are not the best, you cannot be considered very successful in the top university. So therefore, uh, 
if you want to chase a topic that uh, which are hot, the question we want to ask ourselves, will you be able to become the best? If you are not able to do, try to choose the topic that you have a chance to maintain your edge and maintain your excellence. So independent of uh, whether it's machine learning or not, I know the challenges to the students who who students always want to work on to hot topic. That I think is the only reason we shift more toward for the recruitment purpose. But I think it should not be for your research choice. I always use three criteria, interesting, usefulness, and the novelty. And in EDA, in, in academic, you always have to be innovative. The novelty criteria can never be compromised but don't underestimate the other two elements, which is usefulness and the interesting. If you're not interesting, you're not going to do a good job. Good job. If it's not useful, you cannot make impact. So the combination of these three should always be constantly evaluated. So without directly answering whether, which topic would be useful, I think the guideline is develop your career for long term. You're not developing your career for the next three years not developing your career to next get the next grant so um that that's what be my my general answer and the eda by the way i, I think is coming back in a very big way we got to a cold period of time for a few years but now at least in my region everybody talk about electronics and eda so uh is so hot yeah. that uh, amazingly hot, and uh, that remind me in the early '90s when all the department are closing the field of uh, power systems, right? <laughs> and a lot of department, you you old folks are too young, but Nani probably know that the Berkeley even closed the power system de branch in the e EECS department. But once it reached 2000, early 2000, when energy engineering become one of the most important topic. Everybody looking for who is working on energy system, power delivery. Whoever working on that area become the hardest people. And the same as AI. Theory group was the coldest one in the 90s. No student in computer science want to study theory. Even 10 years ago, in my department, people were asking why we have so many theory people. But now we enjoy that we have so many theory people look like the, the best department. But that experience tell all of us that we stick on what we're doing. We need to evaluate regularly. If you're doing something is dying, will not come back forever, don't waste your career. But if it's important field during the winter time, then you wait for spring, wait for summer. And when summer comes, you are in the front, then you will enjoy the success. If you keep chasing the topic that everybody else is chasing, the chance you get in front of others will be way lower than you stick to what you are good at. That's, I think, it's very, very important for younger researchers. And that, that will be my, my piece of advice with someone with white hairs. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with what you said. I think you made it very clear. And I would only add one thing for people who are in EDA, and now in their career, uh, keep in mind to be broad. Uh, EDA is a field, and I think the importance of EDA is that people in EDA solve complex problems through some uh, heuristics typically, and the methodology of EDA can be carried over to other domains. And that's the big opportunity for being in EDA, because again, tomorrow you can be in another field, for example, in drug design, uh, just to give one thing. Um, so that's important, not to be overly specialized. Uh, and we both, because also in uh, forming the grad students, if a PhD student has a broad basis beyond having, of course, a contribution on a particular topic, the students would have more chance to find an ideal job after graduation. I say, uh, so what, what I, uh, if I can add, um, um, I found that the most successful students um, are the ones who are, like Nani said, broad. Um, they also read quite a lot, uh, meaning they are able to be agile and move from one area to another. 
um, you know, throughout their career. So they start as students, they start being very, or they are um, inherently very curious um, and they start in one area, they move to another, um, maybe they come back to where they were, um, but this gives them the opportunity to, to be broad, but not shallow because they do understand um, the internals of every one of these things. Um, so I think that's, that's the, um, I guess what, what separates those who just go for the hot topic uh, because it's hot. Um, and also conviction. Many people will tell you, um, well, when I was doing um, multi-clock um, domain uh, design or, you know, voltage frequency island design, my first proposal, I sent it to NSF in 2003, I believe. Um, there, was, there was a reviewer from a company saying, I, because they self-identified as being an industry reviewer and they said, uh, I have a laptop running on a single clock. I don't see a problem with, with that anytime soon. Um, fortunately, SRC funded that project and then we were able to continue. But um, had I decided, okay, someone from industry tells me this is pie in the sky, why should I even do it? Um, I should have stopped, but I didn't because I had the conviction that this will be really the case. I mean, there's no laptop that runs on a on a chip that is single clock anymore. Um, we know that that's not possible. Um, I mean, at least to deliver performance that we want. So identifying where, uh, what are the directions you need to go, um, things that are, that you're passionate about. Um, and, you know, that combination, I think it's uh, the recipe for success. And, you know, I, I worked with Philip around the same time on electronic textiles and other things. Um, people were saying, oh, that's never going to pan out. And, you know, fast forward 10 or 15 years later at the Met Gala, you see Lady Gaga wearing an e-textile outfit. So we were too early, I guess. <laughs> uh, but you'd, you'd need to have the conviction um, and you need to, if you, you have to believe that it's going to pan out and then uh, eventually someone will, if not you, someone will, will pick it up and, and you'll have the impact. So. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, so I think there is also a follow-up question along the same line. Um, so you guys have led a large research field, a large research group that also involves a lot of writing large proposals and plans. Uh, how do you make these things happen? What are the challenges you face? What are the, some tips that you can give to young people? Well, I think you have to have the courage to make the leap, to bring uh, up new ideas. Um, I, when I moved to Switzerland, uh, I started a big pro uh, program, program, not even project, on uh, electronics and computer science for health and environment. I picked those two areas, and actually, if you look in retrospective, they, were, they are extremely important today, green electronics and protecting the environment and monitoring the health. Um, I think at the beginning, to be quite honest, I had a very big idea of what I wanted to do. And uh, I wrote something that I couldn't submit to any journal or to any conference. People in the field would have laughed at me. I said, well, these are good intentions. But uh, there is nothing to that. But I had the faith to go on, to explain it to my boss, to the president of the university, to carry over this. And of course, as the process was going on, I was reading and talking to people and learning more. So in the end, I put in place this uh, program for 10 years that actually was, uh, um, had a pile of money in there. There was about half a billion dollars involved in this over the years. And that enabled many groups to work in this field and make these fields visible and especially making the Swiss research visible outside, which was extremely important because I think we made a big step forward, you know, from 2000 to now. I've been here for 16 years now. So again, the idea is to have a vision, to have faith in this vision and to be able to fight with that, not to stop when the first reviewer tells you, oh, crap, that's not important. My cousin did it 10 years ago. <laughs> Dig into this figure out why, and uh, keep on, of course, refining the ideas. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree with Nani. What's the, the most important thing is um, what is what is it that you're wor- you want to uh, do in this large project? So um, it's this um, maybe crazy idea that you have, but uh, is it going to have an impact? Second is putting together the team. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you really need, it, it just can't be, you know, the best people in XYZ because XYZ makes up uh, this project. It has to be, be the people that you work well with because if you're going to lead that project, um, they, you have to work well with them. Um, and of course, like Nani said, be prepared to, to take a lot of hits. Uh, we, all, we only see the successes, but, you know, it's a huge iceberg. Um, you see, it's not one third, two thirds. It's actually much worse, especially for the large efforts. So um, I think everyone should have an internal CV with everything they've done, not just the successes, and then look at all the failures that lead to success. Um, it's, it's a long list of failures that leads to success. So and they prepared for that. Um, and um, yeah, and in terms of um, how do you pick the topic, and it's, it, first of all, it has to be relevant. It has to be... Um, it has to speak to you. Uh, you have to believe in it in, in that topic and make sure that the, your team members also are committed because without that, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah. So I can add, uh, I very much agree with uh, what Nani and uh, Diana have said, but additional angle is I feel it's a very natural uh, growth in terms of technical maturity, just like we supervise our PhD student. The first year till they graduate, you can see how much they have grown in terms of their intellectual uh, breadth and the depths. The, likewise, I think for faculty growth, I think in early stage, we tend to be very focused. You try to make name in certain area you're working on and you work on that, the topic yourself 100%. And then, Gradually, I think if you have the flexibility and the vision to look into beyond what you have been doing, the understanding of what matters to what you have been doing. But give you a particular example, EDA has been there for so many years, but people these days talking about EPDA, electronic photonic design automation, because what the photonics are going through is following what the electronic industry has been going through, which require integration, um, all the tool requirement. But getting into that area, you really need to know enough about photonics. Likewise, you want to apply EDA techniques to flexible sensor, et cetera. Then in that technology domain, you need to have this understanding who are the player, what's important there. So that require constant exploration of broaden the knowledge and that does take time. So I, I can see the people who are leading a larger project, typically we ro- require the being able to extend beyond your area. You don't want to include recruit team totally overlap with your expertise instead of have to be complementary. But how to build that team does require the leader have a good understanding of broader field. Therefore, I, I think it's a natural uh, growth for, for many of those, because one thing in academic is, even though you're good at what you're doing, you cannot work on the same topic forever, right? So you try to expanding, you try to extend beyond what you have been doing. That's what uh, some of the more senior people have been working on. And in order to do that, in naturally you have to collaborate with others. And the best way to collaborate with others will be write a proposal and get the funding, then you are committed to do it. Otherwise, if you don't have a, a, a funding source with a larger scale funding to support people coming from different fields, it's almost impossible because we are very busy. You're not going to just regularly have an informal chat with someone uh, without a commitment of meeting regularly. So I would say, I echo what Nanny said, uh, his experiences, my experiences, well, just committed to write a large scale proposal, force yourself and then try to win the proposal. And afterwards you become a multidisciplinary researcher, you further broaden it and you do it once, 
then you have the confidence to do it right twice. And this will continue to grow. So getting out of the comfort zone, after you make your name in the initial topic you have, um, I, I think that that would be, I think my, my main point. Thank you. I, I think, uh, so there are also questions from the audience. So most of the audience are students and young researchers. And uh, some of them have questions about mentorship, uh, especially like during the COVID times, uh, they are looking for advice and tips on how to make their life better, how to make their research career better, especially during COVID times. So I think uh, each of you can answer that. Uh, Philip, you want to go first since you talked about some experiences and you have been practicing some uh, techniques with your students and with your colleagues. Sure. Um, so I think whatever perspective I give will be a, a very personal one. Um, so, you know, take, take whatever, whatever I, I say in context. I think that for me, one of the most important things in my development as a researcher has been the mentors I have had. Um, in some cases, they have been formal mentors. In other cases, it, it's been people who I met either at a conference who made a, a passing remark, which had a significant effect on how I look at the world. Um, I think as a researcher, probably one of the most useful things which I did over time was to enunciate what my research goals are very succinctly. So um, when people ask me what I do, when, whether those people are physicists or chemists or people in computer science, I describe to them what I do as using an understanding of the physical world and the flexibility of human perception to make computing systems more efficient. Now, having a way to describe what you do succinctly is not an easy, or having that succinct description is not an easy um, target to arrive at. And one of the things which you can do is try to formulate what your main research interests are succinctly. It will be, chances are, it will be challenging, but talk to other people and try to explain to them, regardless of what their backgrounds are, what you do. Um, listen to their criticism, um, take on board the things which you describe to them, which they don't understand because quite often when people don't understand what we say, it's because we haven't said those things clearly. Um, so that would be one idea which I would say um, would be worth it, which is try to explain what you do succinctly and to be able to describe it to your colleagues, friends, um, very succinctly. For mentorship, I think don't be shy to ask people for help. Um, one of the most, I hesitate to say, powerful things uh, which anyone ever said to me was, you know, don't be shy to say I need help. Um, when I get an email from someone saying, dear Philip, I need your help with X, no matter how busy I am, I feel really bad if I don't, you know, do whatever I can to, to chip in. Um, so don't be shy. Um, be honest about what you know and what you don't know, because that honesty comes across when you're asking people for help. So if you say to people, I, I read your paper, um, I've done the following background work and I need your help with the following thing. Um, and I realize that, you know, I am deficient in sort of some specific areas of, of technical knowledge, but I think here is a way in which, you know, you could, uh, provide useful input. I would say those would be two things which I would mention as being things which are worthwhile doing to either explain what you do to people or find mentors who might be able to help you in your technical um, growth. Uh, Tim, what would, what would be your advice to students, especially during the COVID times? So I, I feel um, the, my experiences for peers and the advisors, which you, you can interact with, most of them have a 
good faith to help each other. However, to be able to build a very healthy communication, especially online, and that applied to physical meeting as well. What I found is sometimes people going to a meeting or going to a discussion is ill prepared. So you want to ask question, then do your homework for whatever idea, even though it's not well articulated yet, but it doesn't prevent you from list all the fragment thoughts you have. So when I meet with students, I always say, well, I'd like to hear what you're thinking. Instead of you keep asking your advisor or your friends what idea you can give it to me. So take the ownership in the interaction, which means you go to a discussion thinking that it's my meeting. You see a lot of people know how to run meetings because they take this view as this is my meeting. I go to see my advisor. I want to get most of out of my advisor. That's always what I told my students. My time is yours. Try to take advantage of it, use that time. But if every single time you come to a meeting, you could not answer the second question, follow up for the initial question, then people lose interest interact with you. I also share with my students, for example, all students coming to PhD, they have a purpose. They, they want to make progress which is very valuable attitude. But why some students can form a very interesting discussion group, even online today, is because they prepare other people feel valuable when they discuss with you. It doesn't mean uh, <clears throat> they will always learn from you, but having the interesting conversation requires preparation. You read a lot of paper on this topic, you, you can share with others. When, the conversation will be become mutually beneficial. Then the discussion become productive. It does take time. You will don't expect that the first time, second time, or third time you will get this kind of momentum. But seed with this. So my most important advice on this aspect, if you want to improve the communication mentorship, is you are the one to make it happen. And uh, since you're so motivated, willing to spend the most valuable time of your life of pursuing a PhD, I think you can make it happen. So don't expect people will voluntarily read your mind, know how to give you advice. You need to ask the right question. You need to get the conversation discussion going. And that I think is necessary mindset. Uh, to be able to use all the meeting you have discussion with your friend and then they will be interesting sign up for your next meeting and you want to have a discussion. Thank you. Uh, Nani and Diana, you have produced many students who have become professors. So what would be your advice? <laughs> Difficult issue. Um, I think as far as the students are concerned, of course, is to um, get the visibility. It's not only by having the good papers. If you want to have a, an offer in a top institution, you have to have already people knowing you. Uh, as far as the institutions are concerned, I am really supportive of hiring people when they finish their PhD. And uh, this is typically in Europe a major area of contention because the, most people, deans or presidents, like the idea of hiring people after one postdoc or two postdocs. And that makes it too late. Uh, especially, I think, uh, this type of policy is penalizing toward women who typically are more vulnerable because they might like to have a child. And if they prolong their time to enter academia, and then, of course, to receive tenure, that prolongs the time of uncertainty. Um, so I do think that going forward, one should have faith or more faith in the young generation, that is the PhD student at graduation, let's say around 20, 20 80 years of age. Uh, this is typically a common sentiment in computer science, also in Switzerland, but it's not in different branches of engineering. 
already dialectical is more conservative and some other fields are even more conservative. And if you go toward the biomed, that's absolutely a no-no. They want to see you one postdoc or two postdocs. And in my opinion, that makes it too late. So that would be my uh, comment for the university administrators. I would be curious to see what Tim thinks about it and what Diana think about it. Sure, I mean, it, I think it's more common now to see postdocs than we used to. So when I, when I graduated many years ago, more than 20 years ago, um, people used to say, well, if you do a postdoc now, you'll be considered, well, I'm not gonna say the word that I was told, but um, not a winner. <laughs> So, um, so everyone thought you have to go to academia if you want to do it, it has to be right after PhD. But I think we see it more, um, it's more common now. And I think it, it has become more normalized because um, many of the companies run postdoc programs. So even though you might be uh, getting an academic job uh, now, you could defer for a year and then spend one year at Facebook or Google or so, so they normalize the fact that it's okay to have a postdoc and many times now we have programs, right? Um, NSF runs um, a computing innovation fellowship, I believe it's called, um, program for po so postdocs that prepare them for, for academia. Um, but um, again, this is very field dependent like Nani said. So um, it, it, does, it does take education, just like we talked about the publication side. Uh, you need to tell people who who come from the physics side that yeah it's okay to hire people fresh from from grad school and uh, no you should not put in your evaluation the fact that they're too green um, and because sometimes that can be construed as a negative comment um, so you need it, you need to educate others in in I mean ECE or ECS is a very broad broad area and, and there's a lot of, um, like we've seen in, in the review process for conferences, many times people coming from different areas have a different idea as to what kind of feedback I should give authors for this publication. That's another discussion we may be having. But um, but in terms of, I mean, I think the uh, some of the things that were addressed earlier were about the mentoring and the networking that um, you might be having to do to reach your goals. Um, so mentors are, sometimes they're assigned, sometimes you think your research advisor should be your mentor, uh, doesn't have to. I think more mentors is better because there's more eyes um, and more ears uh, for you to listen, um, to, uh, to, to listen to you and that, that can give you advice. Um, and you may have mentors for different things. So maybe for your career advancement, you have a mentor for your career or personal life work balance, you have someone else. Uh, for your research area and progress in the field, you have someone else. For your institution, you have someone who knows the institution, but to work out the field, you, you have other, uh, other people. So, um, but it's, it's a two-way uh, street, right? So you are a mentee, but you're also a mentor. So I think the best mentors are the ones who had good mentors themselves, um, but also the best mentees are the ones who seek out advice. Um, and, um, and it's, um, it's really rewarding to, um, I've had a lot of students and um, I gave them advice. I'm sure they had advice from many other sources, um, but they, they also became great mentors themselves. Um, and not, not just after graduating, but also while they were PhD students, they mentored others. They mentored undergrad students, they mentored master's students who didn't really want to go to get a PhD, but eventually some of them did. Right, so they got inspiration by just working with them. So um, it is really a continuum. And I think even now, I don't consider myself as being done. I mean, I, I mentor quite a few people formally or informally, but I still seek out advice um, because you should always do that. Uh, it's never, uh, it, it's not a, a process that ends, right? Because there's always more that you can learn. So maybe I can comment a little bit about the postdoc versus the, uh, also the uh, early career for mentorship uh, experience. The first of all, I think uh, whether to do postdoc or not used to be field dependent. For example, in uh, biology or health area, 
the statistics show the first independent job is age 37. Typically, you have to do nine years of postdoc before you can get an independent job, which is, I think is very unfortunate. But on the other side of the spectrum is computer science. Typically, uh, the, the graduate, PhD graduate can get a teaching job. But increasingly, we see even for areas which do not require postdoc, more and more uh, PhD want to do postdoc for the good reason. I think it's inevitable that the engineering field and including EDA is getting more and more mature. I think a training under one advisor in the one environment, publishing a few papers, very focused, may still not generate enough confidence for some fresh PhD to be able to start handling teaching, research, fundraising, supervising PhD, et cetera, et cetera. So moving to a different group, doing a couple of years of uh, postdoc experience, which will be counted toward, very often the outputs, research output, will be counted toward for career advancement as well as for promotion. So overall, if you just look at time of investment for doing that, it's in general becoming a plus because almost like you generate research output, but without having too much extra other things suddenly from your shoulder right away. So if you feel you're not ready, but you like to pursue an academic job, postdoc usually is a very good training. Uh, you get in experience for writing proposals, working with other students with the real responsibility of supervising. Come to networking, one piece of advice I think is uh, you need to travel a lot, even though it's COVID-19, we cannot travel. I think having research results, go to conferences, broaden your horizon between your typical network. People will approach you to want to know you. I think the networking and the mentorship is no longer senior versus junior. I think industry versus academic uh, or different field of different perspective for looking at the research, all these are necessary. One last piece I want to use example is when we have a junior faculty, the traditional wisdom was that uh, don't ask a junior faculty to provide too much service in the department because they're supposed to focus on research and uh, doing well in teaching. Service is the last thing you want to waste their time. But later we figure out that that may not be the best arrangement because then the junior faculty don't know what's going on in the department, has no idea when you evaluate, uh, for example, a uh, candidate for a new position, uh, the, the involved in the discussion doesn't know what's important, what's not important. The only uh, job searching experience for academic job is his or her own job searching experience, which is very limited. Therefore, being able to expose to that is kind of learning process as well as how you fit in. Another example is when I become chair, uh, in UC Santa Barbara. Before that, I was very reluctant because the UC chair job is, is a, a job that you have a lot of responsibility, you didn't have any authority. That's a chairship, it's not headship. I didn't want to do it, um, but didn't twist my arm, eventually I agreed. But finally, after a few years of training, I kept telling all the young people, after I did this administration, I did a chair job, I feel I become a better researcher, I become a better teacher. The reason is I was put in the situation to evaluate everybody, to maximize the resource, to have a broader understanding of the topic. You are forced in that position, therefore you will start reflecting on what the time you had spent when you were junior, when you were younger. A lot of time was not well spent. And a lot of things I thought important was not important. A lot of things I thought was not important turned out to be most important. Therefore, using those examples would be, I think, once you start your career as a junior faculty, expose broadly, and especially the professional society and the, in the department, all these issues considered as a networking opportunity. Uh, therefore, those will give you the experience beyond the very narrow experience you gain from your research group Narrow is not by design, but narrow usually is, is unfortunately 
unfortunate outcome because you indeed you just work in the one under one advisor over several years on one topic. Therefore, postdoc experience, uh, services, structure, I think it's all very important part of the networking and the career growth. But uh, managing time, I know it's challenging. <laughs> if I can add one more thing, I think it's, it's important to not think of a linear career, you know, PhD academic job or PhD postdoc academic job. I think many people are also going to industry. Um, I mean, Philip is probably the only one here who had a real job because he worked in industry. All of us are just academics. Um, but, you know, having that industry experience is, is crucial in many respects. It actually creates not just connections, but also knowledge that you might not have otherwise. So, um, I mean, the world is your play field. You can, you can choose whatever you want. Um, just feel passionate about it and then, but plan for it, right? So, um, yeah, um, I think we're, I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> So, uh, so my final question is um, something for the society at large. So we are all professors um, and it's not just us about like writing a paper, writing a proposal or mentoring students, but we also have some social responsibilities. Uh, so like I tend to participate in protests on Black Lives Matters as well as educate myself as well as surrounding people on the diversity and things of that sort of and I try as much as I can to ensure fairness in many communities that I serve. Uh, but I still feel that I'm, as a professor, I can do lo a lot more. Uh, so as a senior colleagues, can you please advise me on like as a professor, what can we do uh, to solve these societal problems? I mean, I, I, I can start, but I don't want to hijack the conversation. Um, I think any opportunity you do not take um, is not just a missed opportunity, but um, it's a lot more. So I learned um, when um, I, I was teaching throughout all these uh, crises. So um, in Pittsburgh, we had the um, Tree of Life shooting. Um, School had started right after Charlottesville, um, so we had many opportunities for, I guess, faculty to interact with students in the classroom. Um, and I think not in, not just in the classroom, but also during group meetings, um, lab um, encounters. Um, even though I'm not teaching right now, I had I did of course um, take time to connect with everyone, students, faculty, staff. Although we are we are pretty much done with school so we're not and we're not on campus but you still have to do it um and i think there, there's the reason i say you have to do the, i think it's it's our responsibility we're not just here to impart knowledge um or inspire people to you know go in this field or another we're also here to make sure that um we connect with them and we support them when they need it because, um, and it's, you know, there are events that may be outside their control, like the COVID or, um, you know, social unrest due to Black Lives Matter, the fact that they feel the need to or responsibility to do something, um, or they are directly impacted by it. Um, you have to be there to understand their needs and support them. And it rather be it, it should rather be proactive rather than reactive. I feel we're doing a lot of reactive things. So we say, oh, now we're going to put our diversity and inclusion plan. Well, you should have had that for like 20 years now, if not more, right? Um, so I think there's um, there's a great opportunity right now to jo not just talk but do things. Um, but we shouldn't forget that it doesn't have to be just people like me who are chairing a department or like Tim, who are deans, uh, it's everyone. You have, you have people in your research groups. Um, you, even if you're a PhD student, you have others who you're working with. So I think it, it's really important. And it, it's so much more important now when we're apart um, than when we're together, um, because it's, um, these things add up. So we might feel like we're operating normally. We're not. Um, it, it's, it's important to put ourselves in other people's shoes and understand their perspective. So um, educate yourself, um, understand why things are happening, 
understand that there is a right and wrong. I mean, there's, I'm sorry, some things are just black and white and you, there's not, oh, some people are good, some people are also good. No, there are things that have to be understood once you educate yourself and you're on the right side and you know how to explain to others. So I think what I told my students um, after Tree of Life, um, I just told them, and I had international students in my class. They didn't understand what, what is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this was the shooting that happened at a Jewish synagogue that was just a few streets away from the campus. And um, I told them, well, educate yourself. You're surrounded by people who are from all over the world. You are from all over the world. So if you walk on the street and someone tells you something or you see something happening, feel free uh, to intervene and educate others. Um, I think... Um, as bystanders, just by being a bystander and not intervening, I think it's more damage than not speaking up. Um, and I think we have to do it more, more so now than ever. Uh, Nani, do you have some advice on that? I think that I, I agree with uh, Diana. We have to stand on the issues. We have to be proactive. And we have to express our opinions. Uh, sometimes we are told that as uh, uh, professors we should shine away from politics, but uh, uh, sometimes you shouldn't. I just recall, for example, five years ago there was a poll in Switzerland to put uh, regulations against uh, immigration from other EU countries, and as a result, uh, a part of the Erasmus programs were cancelled. Uh, that uh, unfor that poll unfortunately passed, and I remember the day after the uh, the vote that many students were very disappointed, and then some of them were asked, "What did you vote?" And they didn't even realize that they voted against their interest. Um, so of course there are some issues that are important enough and that relate to us, where we have to stand clearly and say, "Well, we think that this thing should be done this way." Otherwise, it's harmful for society and for the people around us. I think that's important. Tim, uh, you being a dean, how would you view this as, as well as a senior faculty? Yeah, I think the, all faculty should feel what the lifetime goal is to make societal impact, including our, most important our research results, our educational function, all we're doing is trying to make a difference in the society. Not to mention that if you see problems that in the society, we have the responsibility. Professorship is a very well respect position globally. So I feel that uh, everyone should take the initiative to create something they have passionate about. One thing which I was not realized when I was young, I learned that a lot later was professor platform enable you to do a lot of things. It's not just teaching your class and then doing the research under the grant you're funding. No, there's many other things you can take the initiative to do it. And as an administrator, if I have a young faculty who want to start something, I'm so pleased to see it. Whatever resources he or she wants, I will provide. But the problem is very few professor, because we're busy, very few of them are willing to take the extra energy time to start it. And it's also very difficult in the academic environment for administrators to create something, forcing faculty to do it, because the nature of academic is about enough. So my, I have some very, uh, highly visible young professors, they have passion, for example, for teaching. Um, their research is great, but they make a tremendous impact on co-curriculum. They form a competition team, then they cr uh, recruit the underrepresented member. They even have outreach program for underrepresented uh, disabled uh, uh, kids bring them to do underwater robotics activity. And it start from volunteer work until the point that they really don't have enough bandwidth beyond their teaching responsibility. Then we, 
aside as, as a teaching responsibility doing this outreach because we feel it's just so relevant to the mission of a university. Therefore, we accommodate uh, to allow them to do things which was non-traditional in the typical university environment. Another example is that uh, I want to mention is, you know, graduate student mentor, uh, mental health problem has been a very, very serious issue. Hmm. Then there's young faculty. Typically, we ask the counseling services, et cetera, to, to deal with that. But then there's a young faculty member feel passionate that, that he just cannot stand this anymore. He felt that some situation in the university that uh, we haven't really been able to, to re get help the students get out of their problems. So he created a certain program and they reached the point that it become part of his job. So I try to point out that the, the professorship is a very, very powerful platform. If you feel that you can make a difference, do it. And if you do it well, it can, can become your main job. University can create a position for you to carry out your passion because we're very flexible in terms of how to assign everybody's job and to create a position. Uh, so follow your heart. And uh, at the end, I think we all measure our satisfaction based on what difference we're making. So if you identify a certain area, just carry out your, 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 your uh, passion and uh, fulfill your responsibilities. Thank you. Uh, Aisha and Philip, you have something to add. As uh, young professors, we would like to participate in, in many of these things, right? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, without taking too much time, I'll just say something quick. I think um, what I learned um, throughout this pandemic and then followed by the Black Christ um, moment uh, growing, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's um, never too late to educate yourself and we need to dedicate time for that. So time is something that we are lacking. Like as a PhD student, you are busy, you become a professor, you're even more busy, you get tenured, you get more busy, you get an administrator role, then you get even more busy. So there's always a lack of time, but we do need to set aside time to educate ourselves on important issues. Uh, and I basically suggested the same thing um, to my group, to my students. Uh, so um, identify what you're interested in. Maybe you can't really be interested in all problems of the world. There are too many of them, but identify and then learn more about it. And there are great resources online and there are um, plenty of opportunities to learn from books, from movies. and. Uh, so that's one side. The other thing is I think often we are in our little silos. Like I know a lot of people in my department. I know everybody in my department. But then I realized during this pandemic that I know very few people outside engineering. And that's a, that's a problem. Uh, so we need to make an effort to learn more from people who are remote in other areas and even like who are not professors, you know. So uh, we need, again, to dedicate time and think about like where to go, you know, what interactions to create to basically get out of our comfort zone and meet with others and learn from them. And I think that is very important. And it doesn't ma happen magically. We do like, it's almost like a you know, calendar item kind of thing. Like you need to set aside time to do these things. Uh, Philip? Yeah, I'd like to second two things which um, Aisha said and to add a, a third. So I agree you know, almost violently with what Isa said about educating yourself. I think that is uh, very important. Um, I also agree with the, the idea of literally putting something on my calendar. Um, you know, put the item as a repeating entry on your calendar to, to reach out to people who are different from you or to read about something or to speak to one of your students who you think might have a different perspective from you. I think that is important. I think a very important thing which all of us can do, no matter how senior or junior we think we are, is to set an example. Um, I think when people, when we see someone, whether junior or senior or one of our peers, do something which we believe um, contradicts what is right. I think it's important for us to um, try to address that in, in a constructive way. 
you know, speak to them after the event and, you know, say to them, I think it's often useful to describe to people how the things they have done have made you feel because then it's not confrontational at all. It's, you know, saying to a person, the comment you made made me feel in the following way. And it's not a judgment of them at all. Um, in our roles as leaders of groups, as junior or senior faculty members, I think there are also situations where we need to show leadership. Um, if someone says something which, like Deanna said, really crosses the line, we need to be able to say very politely and immediately, that crosses the line. We do not do that in this research group, in this department, in this institution. Um, and importantly to say that in a way which is not aggressive. Um, it takes practice, um, and I, but I think it's something which all of us um, need to try to do if we can. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. It's, it's important to immediately educate them as uh, Diana pointed out. Um, so I think Irana showed up. I think uh, we are running a little over time. Uh, so there were a lot of questions from the audience, but in the interest of time as well as to keep the topics as diverse as possible. I have to skip some questions. So I'm extremely sorry to those people whose questions haven't been answered. But uh, let me hand the mic over back to you know. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I think you did a very good job you know, today to motivate you know, all the uh, audience and also speakers. I also want to thank for all the you know, panelists today so for them to uh, spending time you know, uh, with us to share all these valuable opinions. I know some of them need to get up very early and the team need to uh, stay very late. Mm -hmm. So and also thanks for all the uh, attendants you know, who are also uh, spending time to participate in this uh, event and also asking the questions. Uh, we I, we uh, still see 10 questions we haven't been able to address, but I will encourage you know, all of our attendants to attend the DAC, you know, you know, where we're going to have the early career workshop and also, also some other events to address all these questions. Again, thank you so much for the speakers and the attendants, and I wish everybody and your family a healthy and happy summer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, Tim. Thank you. Yeah.